At last, a long day's work done. How are you doing, Holmes? Fine, Watson, just fine. I suppose you still haven't heard any news from Whitechapel? No, Watson. It's been almost a month now. Who knows, our killer may have brought justice upon himself, overcome by remorse and ignominy for his actions. Not a chance, Watson. You haven't done anything about the story of a kidney that was sent in the post and reported by the papers. Why not? The killer left a message on one occasion with the intention of harming. The letter accompanying this package served no purpose other than to give value to its recipient and arouse disgust against its sender. The killer has never done anything for nothing. In order to authenticate the Galston Street message, he left an indisputable piece of evidence. Can we really say as much about this kidney? I don't know. All I know is that there are letters piling up on your desk. Isn't it time to move on to another case? Absolutely not, Watson. I think that the other Joseph is reluctant to meet me. The man he saw must certainly have put the fear of God in him, a man well known for his violence and his hatred towards Jews. There can't be any shortage of those in Whitechapel. I have hope yet. As for Dr. Tumblety... We found him, Mr. Holmes. We found him. Who's that? Dr. Bumblebee. He's been locked up by the Bobbies, but they've let him loose. Oi! He was looking round like a rat who's scared of his own shadow. He's going to do a run at years. Watson, this is our chance. The game is afoot. Let's hope that Tumblety will go to collect his trunk. As for you, my little friends, thank you for lifting this burden that has been on my shoulders for almost a month. He is here. The doctor is here, up in his room. Peeking through my door, I saw him go up the stairs, and I think that he has a pistol. Regarding the trunk, did you do what I told you to? Yes, I jammed the lock and filled the trunk with stones. Should we call the police? Absolutely not. Go home, lock your doors, and if you hear a gunshot, shout as loudly as you can. Watson, we must disarm this man at all costs before attempting to confront him. Come, have your pistol at the ready and stay alert. Don't move a muscle or I shoot. Who? But what is going on? Bravo, Watson. I take back everything I ever said about your less than full involvement in our investigations. Listen, Mr. Policeman. I already told everything to your colleagues at the station, so... Don't you believe it, sir. We're not with the police. We are here to talk about human organs, an area in which you seem to have a great deal of interest. What? But who are you? We are the ones holding the pistol. Listen, Tumblety, tell us everything you know and you will be spared from the noose or a bullet. Have you tried to get hold of any female genitalia from someone during these past months? <laughs> so that's it. You English. Listen, as it happens, I do have a collection of female genital organs which I hold dear and never miss the chance to show my friends whatever the occasion. If you knew what I feel when my eyes meet the young men's as they contemplate with astonishment and disgust this soft and flabby skin that they worship and place at the center of all their passions. Women repulse me, gentlemen. They are one of nature's greatest mistakes. Lying, haughty, and most of all, nauseating. No, sirs. Men. Mankind. We are not made to soil ourselves with such animals, and it is my task to educate my peers, like the ancient Greeks used to do, and put them on the path to masculine relationships, the only kind worthy of our intelligence. My God, this man has lost his marbles, Holmes. You haven't answered my question. Did you attempt to obtain any female organs? Indeed, but a long time ago. I was living in Liverpool at the time. A few of my specimens were starting to lose their freshness. But despite the sum proposed, the heads of the university hospitals refused to accede to my demands. The fear of what others would say, certainly. I know nothing more similar to an arrogant fowl than an English doctor. Yakety yak. 
always showing off in the courtyard with their haughty airs. And as soon as... Shut it, Tumblety. So, was it you who killed all of these women? Yes or no? I regret to say that it was not. If I had really wanted a few more uteri, I would have had them brought in from the United States, where it would cost me much less than here. Or I would have shown a few gold coins in the hallways of a morgue or a hospital in London, and they would have kissed my feet to sell them to me. And not taken the least risk. But kidneys are all the latest, aren't they? I think that I could find one tomorrow for less than a pound. In short, gentlemen, I do not know your killer, and I don't know why he's doing that. But if you come across him one day, please send him my friendship and my deepest respect. You've gone too far this time. Come, Watson, let's not get carried away now. Thank you for your assistance, Doctor. If I may offer some advice, you should leave England as soon as possible. Each day that you remain in this country is a risk that an intelligent man would not take. My pistol? Without that, it will be even more risky. Can we believe this man, Holmes? He can't be the murderer, and his story regarding the organs fits. But we can't afford to take the slightest risk. I will ask the Baker Street Irregulars to follow him. Listen, lads, when Tumblety leaves here, follow him discreetly, and come and tell me as early as possible tomorrow where he is currently residing. Understood? Understood, Captain. You are already ready, Holmes. What is going on? I have been waiting for you for at least an hour, Watson. It would appear that a new drama has unfolded. The youngsters came to give me this address, but I have some doubt as to the actual location we are going to. Let's try anyway. At worst, we may come across the Baker Street Irregulars to put us in the right direction. We are lost, Holmes. No, we're not, Watson. We are heading for the very street I'd hoped for, but as I wasn't sure it was this one, I've made a few big detours in order to find the right one. I'll know it when I see the name. Why, of course, Holmes. Why didn't I think of that? The great Sherlock Holmes can't... How are you, my friend? Are you not feeling well? No. My friend is a doctor. He can take care of you. Don't go there. She, she, he came here and he... Now, now, Watson, take care of him. Can't talk. Wait for the coppers. Are they coming? My eyes are crying. Uh, no. Go find them too, mister. I'll stay here and keep an eye out. Go! No, I must await my friend. Ah, here he is. Watson, are you there? How are you? Uh, fine, Holmes. And you? What happened? Hello, sir. Where are we, Watson? In Whitechapel, Holmes. This must be Dorset Street. You don't seem very well. Do you need something? Indeed, Watson. Some clay, a great big piece of clay. I would ask for some wine, too, but as you know, I taste nothing but melodrama. What is over there? A trip from which you will never return, Watson. Trust me, don't go there. A trip? Behind this door? In this room? It's not strictly a door, it's more of a portal, a threshold. And what lies behind it is not the mortal realm, Watson. It is a place beyond time and space, the gift of a frantic artist who made use of his talent in order to grant us access to his world, Watson. Beyond that threshold is an abyss. Hell. The police won't take long to arrive, and the last thing I want is to waste precious time on them. Could you lead me out of this area and take me home?
you should come and eat, Holmes. Mrs. Hudson has worked wonders. The joint has been cooked medium rare. If only you would tell me what was in the courtyard. The answer, Watson. The answer, Holmes? Yes, the answer to a question that you asked me a few weeks ago. How the devil can the answer to a question I asked you be found in that courtyard? And what question are you referring to, Holmes? How our killer set about reaching the height of horror by taking another victim, Watson. <coughs> Did I not tell you that I wanted to avoid melodrama? Do you mean to say that... Yes, that's what was in that room. You helped towards the colour. All that's missing is the odour, but I shall let that pass. The mutilations almost all resulted in large removals of flesh. My photographic memory noted them all in great detail, the shape, size and location, and thanks to the softness of this clay and your medical knowledge, I believe we can attempt to determine what is missing from this lady. Don't you think we should wait for the medical examiner's opinion? Surely not, Watson. This massacre has gone on long enough. I can assure you that I will do everything in my power to get our hands on Jack the Ripper before this night is out. Watson, we shall reconstruct the body of this poor woman and inspect it in detail as well. Your help as a medical man will be invaluable. Holmes, I... I feel a bit unwell. Well, I understand. I will manage on my own. Her throat was slit just like the others. The wound is particularly deep. There were incisions in the rib cage, as if to inspect the lungs. The liver was neatly removed. organ is missing, apparently. I must specify which organ this is on my list. There we are, Watson. We have examined everything. The heart is the only thing missing. Two uteri, a kidney, and now a heart. He had all the time he wanted in which to disfigure her, cut her up like a piece of meat, and yet took nothing but the heart. What do you think of that, Watson? Watson? I dread to think how you'd react if you saw a corpse. I'm returning to Whitechapel, Watson, to Isaacs. If the heart tells you to come with me, if the heart tells you a little wordplay there. <laughs> Let's go to the cobblers. Let's go to the cobblers. Beep, beep. Evening, Mr. Holmes. Good evening, Hardiman. Has Abraham Solomnovich still not reopened his shop? No, not that I know of. Have you heard anything about the latest murder? Certainly there is talk of nothing else. Poor girl. I hope they catch the bastard who did it. Who do you think that could be? A madman, that's for sure. Everyone in the area is pinning it on a Jew. But I don't believe that for a second. Why? Because Jews don't like blood, you see. They're not allowed to eat it, and they have to drain the meat before cooking it. It's true that they eat animals, but they are fanatical about all kinds of silly things. I don't know much about their rituals and all, but I know that a Jewish butcher can't just do whatever he pleases with his knife. He has strict kosher rules to follow. You seem to be very well informed. Well, I buy my meat from them too. My clients don't care whether the meat comes from Jews or not. Cats eat it regardless. And let me tell you, I'd go as far as to say that I may even have more faith in a Jew, because even if they don't eat all the offals, a Jew inspects them to see if the animal was in good health. Lungs, for the most part. And as they make up most of my cat's meat, you can see the connection, right? 
Jews are allowed to eat offals? Ah, uh, yes. They eat calves' kidneys, I think. How big is that? A calf's kidney? Ah, well, that depends if it's fresh or if it's been marinated in brine or cooked. When fresh, are they as big as a human kidney? They would be, yes. You know, Mr. Hardiman, it's lucky for both of us that the murder that took place in your mother's courtyard was only the Whitechapel killer's third. Had it been the first, I wouldn't be thanking you as I'm doing now for all of this important information. Goodbye and take care. If you say so. Right, farewell, Mr. Holmes. Let's go to the cobblers. Good evening, Mr. Solomnovich. Evening, Mr. Holmes. If you've come about the business of my cousin, I hate to say... Before you respond to my request, I must ask you to answer this question of the utmost importance. What offals are Jews allowed to eat? Well, the same as you. Kidney, heart, liver? Yes. How are they prepared? Kidneys are boiled, heart is often finely sliced and cooked on a skewer, and liver is always grilled. These offals, do they come from cattle? Yes, beef or veal. And eating non-kosher food would be a grave affair for a Jew, isn't that right? Yes, it would be very serious. But what are you getting at? If I were to tell you what I'm thinking, Mr. Solomonovich, you would pull out your own eardrums to not hear the end of my sentence. It goes against the beliefs of hundreds of members of your community, and for some, perhaps even worse. I will ask you one last time before involving the authorities, who I assure you will be far less discreet than myself. Do you know who the second Joseph is, the Aldgate Butcher, who your cousin knows from the Imperial Club? His name is Joseph Hyam Levy, but I don't know where he lives. I know nothing about him other than he's a member of the Imperial Club on Duke Street. That street is after Church Passage, coming from Mitre Square, am I right? That's it. Thank you. You have been an enormous help to both of us. Now, listen carefully. I need you to find four or five strong men among the members of your family who you trust wholeheartedly and to wait here with them until my arrival or you receive a message from me. Is that clear? But if you will tell me... Later, Mr. Solomonovich. Later. Let's go to the Imperial Club. Ah, there's the Imperial Club. Let's see if I can find Joseph Hyam Levy. Hello, sir. Hello. Can I help you, sir? Indeed. I have an urgent message for Mr. Joseph Levy, the Aldgate Butcher. Oh, I regret, sir, but Mr. Levy is not at the club at present. You can wait for him if you wish. I thank you. Do you know where I can find him? His home address, perhaps? It is a very urgent matter. I am sorry, sir, but we do not give out information regarding the club members to people outside the group. I understand. I must find a way to enter the Imperial Club without having to go through the entrance hall. This may come in handy. A note encouraging members of the Jewish community to remain prudent and vigilant after rumours about the Whitechapel murders. It's a service door and firmly locked. There must be a stock room in the cellar beneath this room. There is a cellar window behind this barrel, which is preventing me from passing. If I can just get into the coal cellar, I shall be in the place. There we are. My pivot is in place. Now, let's find something to tip over this barrel.
I should be able to make it tip over. Closed. The cellar window is locked from the inside by a simple iron hook. Let's go. Good. Let's try to find the exit that leads to the club. This may come in handy. Empty tin cans. Let's hope that it really is the key to this door. Administration, perfect. This must be where the information on club members is kept. Some square metal tokens. Curious, there is a document. There must have been litigation between Joseph Hyam Levy and Jacob Levy. A page from an old Yiddish-English dictionary. Court's proceedings. Curious. This must be the club's safe. What I'm looking for is probably inside. The lock on this chest is very sophisticated. Let's see. These documents contain some words in Yiddish, which reads from right to left. Excellent. Now, on to the next step. Here we are. I have the address of this Joseph Chaim Levy, 36 Middlesex Street. Now, let's try to get out of here without being seen. This may come in handy. I can't get out through the window. It's blocked and appears to be reinforced. I'll have to find another way out. Blast! My exit has been sealed off. The barrel was replaced. I'll have to find another way. I need something. Now, let's quickly hide in administration. Thank you. 
Let's visit Joseph Levy at 36 Middlesex Street. Here I am in Middlesex Street. Let's find number 36. Hello, sir. What do you want? Hello, ma'am. I would like to speak with Mr. Levy. Do you know if he's in? I am Mrs. Levy, his wife. He's not arrived yet. Do you know when he'll be in? Oh, no idea. You know, he works at the butchers and helps at the slaughterhouse. It often happens that he doesn't come in until early morning and then leaves right away. Well, listen, as soon as your husband Joseph returns, tell him that... My husband isn't called Joseph. You aren't the wife of Joseph Haim Levy? No, of course not. I'm the wife of Jacob Levy. Mr. Hyam Levy used to live here with his parents, but he moved. I... Mommy, Mommy, who is the man that you are talking to? But this poor child has syphilis. He carries the mark on his face. Leave us, children. Go back inside with your brothers and sisters. Yes, Mother. <sighs> As I was saying, Mr. Hyam Levy doesn't live here. He works in a butcher's near Aldgate, but I don't know exactly where. But if you find him, he will surely live next door. Butchers always live near their work. Could you possibly give him a message on my behalf? It just... I don't see him often and... Well, even though we know him, we aren't on friendly terms, you see? Is he bothering you, Mommy? No, Simon, not at all. That's a handsome boy you have. It's strange that he has light hair. He takes after his father. Strong, with light hair. Wait, he sounds familiar to me. A man of about 50 years old, very big, at least six feet tall and left-handed, correct? You are mistaken yet again. My husband is only 32 years old, no taller than five foot three, and he's right-handed. Obviously, there are many Levies in the area. I will leave you, and I pray that you'll excuse the disturbance. Perhaps we will have the pleasure of meeting again. Farewell, ma'am. Goodbye, sir. Daddy! I must return to Baker Street. Let's go to Baker Street. Well, Watson, not looking so good. Whose fault is that, Holmes? If you hadn't shown me your masterpiece in clay... Some actions have much larger repercussions than would be assumed at first glance. Listen, Watson, in a few minutes I will leave Baker Street in order to meet Jack the Ripper and put an end to his crimes. Beforehand, I want to go over all our discoveries to assure myself that everything is clear. Jack the Ripper? You know the identity of Jack the Ripper? Without a shadow of a doubt, Watson, and I assure you that we are in possession of all the elements required to determine who Jack the Ripper is. Would you like to do this work with me? Well, we are still missing certain information in order to finish this investigation, Watson.
perfect, Watson. Let's determine who Jack the Ripper is, Watson. Thus, we have five suspects. Let's add the elements that correspond to each of them. And there you go, Watson. Jacob Levy, Jack the Ripper. Fantastic, Holmes. And terrifying. But some aspects of this case are still unclear, at least for me. For example, Watson? Why does the man only kill prostitutes? The man kills prostitutes because he blames them for the misery of his life. He must have frequented them assiduously, and, during these nocturnal visits, he contracted syphilis, which he passed on to his spouse, and via her, at least one of his children. He is an angry man in despair, following a mistake that cannot be fixed. Why does he only kill such miserable prostitutes? He never had the means to afford prostitutes of higher standing than Nichols, Chapman and the others. At one point in his life he was forced to steal to make ends meet. This indiscretion cost him dearly. He was imprisoned and exiled from his community. He had frequented low-class prostitutes. Thus, it was they who infected him and they who must pay. But why did he remove the organs? To take vengeance on his own community, which rejected him and had more success than he. He is a man who bore the burden of a sinister reputation, that of a thief and a madman because of his internment. So he took his vengeance in the most cowardly and horrific manner imaginable. He rubbed his knife on the uterus of a sick prostitute before using it. He passed Edow's kidney off as a veal kidney. Why did he disfigure the faces of the last two victims? Revenge yet again, Watson. This is what you did to my child. You will suffer the same fate. And the piece of apron and the message at Goulston Street? The only reason to have placed the piece of apron incriminating the message and attracting attention towards himself is that the people that Levy holds responsible for his arrest live in this building. The butchers where he committed the theft is found in Goulston Street, and the majority of the butchers who denounced him surely live close to their workplaces. But finally, Holmes, why didn't his wife or anyone else notice anything? His wife has many children and must be very busy. The man is a butcher, which must facilitate things when one is questioned by the police in the street and must justify the bloodstains on oneself. Furthermore, butchers often work during the night as the meat must be sold fresh each morning. His nocturnal absences were easily justifiable. Finally, he works in a butcher's or slaughterhouses. Nothing could be more simple than slipping a kidney in here and using a knife soiled with human blood there. This story is frightful, Holmes. Indeed, Watson. Lies, infidelity, venereal disease, murder, mutilation, and finally cannibalism. A complete anthology of what humans at their most vile are capable. Let's go at once to Whitechapel and put this madman where he can do no more harm, Holmes. Let's, Watson.
I do believe we are not alone. I hope these men won't prevent us from passing. Me? No. But you, yes, Watson. Your journey ends here tonight. Pardon? You are sometimes a little hot-headed. Uh, moreover, Mr. Solomonovich has a few things to tell you. I won't be long. You can come in, Mr. Holmes. He's waiting for you inside. Everything was organized according to your instructions. I don't know how to thank you. Later, later. Dr. Watson is awaiting an explanation from you. Hello, Watson. Holmes, have you the slightest idea what you are doing? I think so, Watson. Leaving this bloodthirsty pervert at liberty and hiding his existence from the London police? What folly! Certainly, the police will never find their man, but with so many men deployed, this affair will indirectly have a benevolent effect on the crime in the vicinity. But Holmes, wait! Justice hasn't been served, and we are accomplices to the fact. Justice? But I don't serve justice, Watson. I serve truth. And, incidentally, I serve my country, and I don't think that I have ever served it better than today. Imagine if, after months of terror and a murder as abominable as that of Miller's Court, we deliver to the English people a man of the Jewish faith, a journeyman, and head of family as the guilty party. A man who forced members of his own people to eat human flesh. All of this contained tension would have exploded in a myriad of anti-Semitic acts which would have thrown Whitechapel into a rage of fire and blood. And this man's family, who are completely innocent and have suffered more than their lot, would have been the first in the line of sight. Should we condemn an entire people to shame and promise them a thousand wounds because one of their members committed an unmentionable crime? Neither I nor you have the right to do so. Jacob Levy, Jack the Ripper, is now in the hands of his own people. 
I have complete faith in Mr. Solomonovich and the members of his community who, I remind you, courageously helped us. They took great risks and acted with the most salutary discretion. And, oh yes, it is understood that you cannot chronicle this investigation. It would be best to invent a story that takes us far from London during the somber period in pursuit of, let's see, something challenging. A ghostly dog that glows in the night. Don't be ridiculous, Holmes. But what will happen now? The police will endure a serious setback and a real loss of credibility. And... and this... this man? Well, a few months after the murders have ceased, the police commission, finding themselves at an impasse, will come up with a story to tell, and everyone will vow that they know the secret identity of the killer without having the right to reveal it. As for Jacob Levy, Jack the Ripper, he will be imprisoned by his own people. He will pace like a lion in its cage until the end of his days, haunted by his crimes, haunted by his crimes and his insatiable vengeance, until finally the disease which drove him to kill those poor women will finish its work and make him its final victim. <laughs>